A seasoned analyst of emerging travel trends, our next speaker has worked with Focusrite and authored numerous publications for nearly two decades. Please welcome Senior Technology and Corporate Market Analyst at Focusrite, Norm Rose. So blockchain. Blockchain is the most revolutionary technology to come along, turning the internet to the internet of value. Blockchain is the most overhyped technology right now, where we had all the major OTAs saying, maybe a one, maybe a two. Well, what happens when you have new technology like this is that the truth is somewhere in the middle. Now, we look a lot at the faucet. We look a lot at the interface. Here's a new interface. It's voice. It's chat. It's a digital assistant. But really, the power around blockchain is around the plumbing. And talking about the plumbing is not very sexy. Now, the presentation I'm going to give you is very, very rudimentary. It's very simple. And people who are involved with blockchain probably are going to be bored to death. But I want to have a presentation that at least simplifies it for everyone, so everyone's on the same page. So there was a gentleman named Satoshi Nakamoto. Or maybe it's not a gentleman. Maybe it's a bunch of people. No one really knows. Lots of speculation. But this person, during the financial crisis in 2008, created Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin has been the most successful cryptocurrency. And I'm sure you're going to say, Norm, well, what about all the illegal activities and you know, the crashing of one of the exchanges? That's true, but Bitcoin, over $6,000 for a single Bitcoin today. And then we have what we're really talking about, which is the blockchain. That is the technology that was developed to support digital currencies. And then we have another major currency called Ethereum. Ethereum introduced the concept of smart contracts, which are going to have a major impact on all industries, and actually has enabled the creation of a blockchain on top of an existing blockchain called Ethereum. But this is about centralized versus decentralized. So we're all familiar with the data center. We're all familiar with the fact that it has been vulnerable. Equifax, Saber, a lot of vulnerability there. Versus the idea of a blockchain, which is a bunch of nodes operating on peer-to-peer. -peer. If you use any voice over IP or Skype, you're using a peer-to-peer -peer network. This is not that new. But one thing that became new for blockchain was the idea of keeping a record of the actual transaction, the buyer, the seller, the settlement. And that still is being done in this central environment versus the blockchain has a copy of the ledger on every node. The other thing about blockchain to keep in mind is that it's really around encryption. It's encryption at its core. And that when a, a, a record is put on the blockchain, it cannot be changed. It's immutable. It uses all sorts of cryptography, private, public, as well as hash. And so this is kind of a, a look at a block. And you can see it has an Iceland map there, but we really don't know anything about this. And there's a bunch of numbers there on the top right, and that's the hash. These things are out on public record. They're on a public blockchain. Very difficult to figure out who that is. That's the encryption. So very simplistic steps in a blockchain. This is so simplistic, is the idea I want to buy something and someone has something to sell. It gets put on the blockchain. It gets verified by an entity called a miner. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. It then, uh, after that, it then gets actually added to the blockchain. And you have settlement. And that's it. Now you understand blockchain. That's very simplistic. A lot of stuff goes behind the scenes. But when we look at different roles. This role of the miner is often kind of misunderstood. What is a miner in a blockchain? Well, very sim simplistically again, a miner solves a cryptographic puzzle, a math mathematical problem. Now, generally, it's not someone sitting on a computer doing that. It's someone who's created a program. And in a public blockchain, there's a competition. Who's going to resolve this? And what they're doing is verifying that the person who wants to buy something has the funds and verifying that the person or entity that's selling some type of product or service has the funds. And for that, they get compensated in 
digital currency. If you were a miner in Bitcoin in the early days, you're pretty wealthy right now. So this idea of smart contracts is very important. So think of it as code that automatically executes a contract. So again, very simplistic. An agreement is reached. A contract is created on the block, and then some type of triggering event happens, and we see it suddenly getting fulfilled. So what if a certain rate was negotiated with a corporation, and the person at the corporation buys that? That rate is put into the blockchain, and it's immutable. It can't be changed. And it's done, auto and that's done automatically through the smart contract. So it's important to understand permission versus permissionless blockchains, sometimes called private versus public. So in the sense of a, and we're going to have both of them exist, by the way, as this, this technology matures. So a private, the users are, are not anonymous. We know who the users are. We know who the uh, miners are. And it's controlled by some type of entity. But it uses the distributed letter, ledger in order to have a more secure and productive uh, product. So public is a little different. Pro public, you don't know the uh, specifics about the users. They're anonymous. And each has a local copy of the ledger. And the, the thing that you've heard, probably, is that blockchain's going to eliminate the middleman. Well, in a private blockchain, what we have are either existing middle companies, middlemen companies, or new companies, but they act as a middleman still. Versus a public, there is no middleman at all. And that's important to keep in mind, because if we're trying to remove the middleman, which was what basically Bitcoin did with banking, it could have a significant effect. But let's face it, OK? Tomorrow, is blockchain going to put, out, put these OTAs and GDSs out of business? No, it's not. But it has the potential to change their role. So think about telephone companies years ago. They used to make their money talking on the phone. How many minutes were you on the phone? What's happened to the telco companies? They've become ISPs. They've migrated to wireless. They have a different business model. And that might happen with everyone on this list due to the blockchain technology. So what are some of the areas where blockchain could play a, a role in the travel industry? Well, transparency. I think everyone who's involved in the travel industry knows that the financial flow of funds is not very straightforward. Having intermediaries who sell travel not pay for technology because they get actual rebates, it's not the cleanest system in the world. Blockchain could have the value of really removing that type of element and having total transparency. Settlement, this is probably the number one area where I think we'll see blockchain emerge within the travel industry. Reducing settlement costs, reducing settlement time. Loyalty, it's been, there's been discussion about having loyalty as a currency, that we're going to now have blockchain kind of based loyalty programs that allows interoperability between different programs. Fraud. Everyone knows that fraud is a major problem in the industry, and blockchain will help resolve that. Now, I'm not saying today, though, that fraud is going to be eliminated, and when you have a blockchain-based plumbing, that there's no fraud. There's, there's going to be bad actors out there, but it does help reduce fraud tremendously. Identity. Imagine if, I think, ultimately, the goal would be that you would own your own identity. That identity would be used for everything of walking through the airport to checking the hotel, that you have this identity and it can't be changed. The idea of Internet of Things, everything from baggage to assets of an airline at an airport, perhaps something around overbooking. And there's a whole set of applications that could be applied to the corporate travel industry, contracts, as I mentioned a moment ago. But to say that blockchain is ready for prime time, and is going to be that immediate, ignores the fact that it's still a young technology. And it does feel a little bit like the beginning of the internet. And the idea that you have a, a Bitcoin transaction that takes about three to four uh, Bitcoins per second versus an Ethereum transaction, which is 20 or 25 transactions per second, versus a credit card, 
which is 2,000 transactions per second. That's a big gap. But the reality is, is that there's an awful lot of young programmers who are working to improve, whether it's through the Lightning Network or the Plasma concept, the speed of the blockchain. And this is going to be a big focus. There's also some concern about the fact that this is a public network. What does it mean to have something out on a public network? You know, from my view, it's highly encrypted. You're probably protected, but there are some folks who have concern about that. The other thing about blockchain is the volatility and whether it's being used for speculation or it's actual utility. There's an awful lot of bad actors out there. They're doing token releases, or they like to say ICOs, but most try to avoid that term, initial coin offering that are just doing it for speculation. So here's some travel examples as far as the blockchain. So we, we've heard about this. You may have read some of this in the news. TUI Group, one of the largest travel companies in the world, is using blockchain to put their hotels on the blockchain to have a more of a seamless system. Webjet did something similar. S7 Airlines is working with a Russian bank on a blockchain initiative. Uh, there was a uh, workshop by the TripX folks who are introducing TripCoin as a way of having a commerce uh, standard for travel transactions. BlockSky also is another company that's looking for a travel-based uh, uh, system. And Infinity is a corporate booking tool. IATA has proposed their own digital currency, an IATA coin. So that's all happening there. But there's also another event that's happening. Full disclosure, I am an advisor to Winding Tree. So I wouldn't interpret my next few sentences of anything other than I'm obviously a little biased here. But Winding Tree is a permissionless blockchain. And when the token event happens in, in February, the idea is through a nonprofit organization is to take the information, the, the money, excuse me, raised by the token event and to fund innovation within the travel industry. So to close up, here's the things I'd like you to remember about blockchain. It's all about the plumbing. You have to be cognizant of how the plumbing is now, and you have to look at how blockchain is going to change that. It's a new distributed network. That's the core. And it has the potential to be a new tra travel platform. And the idea is this may actually be our Linux moment. If we can harness the software development power of the masses to make a better travel system that's more open, that allows more innovation, we're going to have our own Linux. Thank you.